I am Jan Kjetil Arnulf. I am the Dean Executive at BI. And on behalf of the President of BI and the Provost for Outreach, I'm very happy to welcome you all to this. I also understand that we have some listeners in China. So, go uh, Lindao, Laibin, Dajia Hao, Huan Ying, Jin Tian, the webinar. Butcher out some short webinar, but this is okay. Everybody's welcome. I hope you all will enjoy today's show. Okay, we have with us today. Um, I'm trying to make this uh, all, all of this uh, technology work. Uh, there are some hiccups every now and then, but here we are. We have today's um, presentation, and it's coming right up. And where are we? Uh, I'm sorry for my uh, illiteracy in. Uh, in technological terms, but we are adapting quickly, I would say. So there we are. This is today's lecture called Leading Your Team Through Stormy Weather. And with us today, uh, we are fortunate and very grateful to have with us Mr. Sven Mollekleib, who is Senior Vice President for Sustainability at DND GL. He is here in Norway, he's also famous for being an honorary president at Norwegian Red Cross, where we have heard his voice years talking about humanitarian tragedies and crises. We also have with us Mr. Odin Johannesson, former army general in Norway and now director of the Business and Industry Security Council, a person who has seen a long range of international and local uh, difficult situations. And I'm really happy that these two gentlemen will come in and share their experiences with us today. It is possible to ask questions. Uh, the way we have been outlining this is that we, I will just now give a short introduction to the topic. I hope to leave as much as possible of the time to our distinguished guests. Um, but you, will may, you may use the, um, the chat to send in your questions and we will do our best to accommodate the questions, preferably towards the end. But if there are important questions to be raised along the way, we have people reading it and trying to make the best out of today's audience participation. Me, myself, uh, I am in this situation an um, organizational psychologist, a clinical psychologist. I have been a part of a couple of crises myself, I might say, but not anywhere near these two guests today. So I am just going to give a small academic heads up about the topics that I was hoping that we might cover in this uh, special session. Many years ago, I had a textbook uh, that we used to have for uh, you know, dealing with crisis management. In that textbook, there was something called a wheel of crisis. And you can all see probably now the wheel of crisis on the screen in front of you. It was the idea that any organization might face one or other of these types of crises. The reason I put this wheel up here today is that I think uh, we are today probably facing most of these things that you will find on this wheel, if not all of them. You will find that this, what's ongoing is a natural disaster. This is, the virus is a natural thing, it happens. But it does have a tremendous effect on a long range of issues that face organizations around the world. We obviously have personnel crisis. We lose people for longer or shorter time. Uh, People are taking criminal advantage of the situation. We have an information crisis. We certainly don't really know how to deal with this. This is also a physical crisis because it limits the ways that we can move and travel and cooperate. It is def definitely an economic crisis. This hits the way that we can make a living, all of us around the globe. And it's a, a, obviously also uh, a matter of reputation, it's a matter of information. In short, this is a crisis that is a perfect storm. A lot of people have been saying that, but I think this is an appropriate term for what we are facing now. So how should we deal with this? Um, I can see here I have, a, this is a glitch for me, I had a, a Norwegian slide in here, that was not my point. Um, I could just skip to this one, which is uh, for, taken from um, Norwegian playwright Henry Gibson, which is the big monster that faces the, the main protagonist of the story, Per Gint, a huge monster that he's fighting with. He doesn't really want to fight back. It's impossible to wage a war. And this crisis 
is, in many ways, a matter of how do we understand this? How do we conceptualize what's going on? And how do we communicate around what's going on? And you will find that the situation has different descriptions in different countries, in different industries, and across different professions. For us as a business school, I want to add that pandemics have always fallen in the footsteps of business and commerce. That is, of course, because doing business, doing trade, and cooperating in technology requires that people communicate, interact, and have contact. That is why a pandemic is always also hardly hitting economic exchange and, of course, matters of personal security, food, and social infrastructure. When we're looking at today's businesses, this is no different. By looking at something apparently American as a Boeing aircraft, you will see, I just picked this out as a random uh, illustration, business is no longer local, even if there is, uh, you know, um, today protectionism is very much the rage in many governments, but still we are all extremely interlinked in ways that are only appearing to us now. We can see now how the fabric of the modern global society is providing a background for the virus to play out in ways that we really hadn't imagined as possible before. In this situation, of course, we would all want it to go away. We would all want, if we could just sit still for a couple of days and everything would be go away, it would be fine. But one of the questions we keep facing all around the world is, how long can we afford to stay indoors to keep safe? So I want, just wanted to put this painting that you can see on your screen out there now to show you that in all times, people will have to weigh the crisis, the risks and the benefits against each other. So at which point is the cure creating more problems than the problem itself? And we obviously, we need the food, we need the safety, we need the infrastructure, socially and physically. So this is a matter of interpretation. How do we go about to understand what is necessary? Which risks can we minimize in order to move along? The sections of the webinar today, as I had hoped it to unfold, will be like this. I wanted my distinguished guests today to talk first about the local operations, the crisis as it hits you, your business, your team, what happens here and now, the things very close to home. How do we lead the local operations? How do we manage to survive, both physically and of course, how do we survive as a business, as a society, as an organization? And how do we minimize the risks that will be out there and minimize the harm? So this is where we will go first. I will ask each of the guests to have a say on these two topics or these topics. And then uh, after a round of comments and stories around this, I will proceed to the next question. How do we address the global and the long range term perspectives that will face us here? This is just one way of looking at it. We could have started the other way, but I think it's fair to say, let's start, start talking about the personal experiences. What can we say to those of you who are sitting out there right now and face very acute, immediate concerns? And then we'll move out to the bigger perspective as this webinar unfolds. So with this, I would like to ask uh, the first of our guests, um, Director and former General Odin Johannesson, please. Uh, I will welcome you to come in here now and share some of your experiences and some of your thoughts on this. Please welcome Odin Johannesson. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, webinar <clears throat> on such a very interesting and, and relevant uh, theme. It shouldn't uh, be a surprise to any of you that as a soldier and an officer, uh, my starting point is people. In my opinion, leadership is all about people. How to understand people, how to understand how they think, how they feel, how they 
operate under the uh, different circumstances and how your personal uh, impact on them may make them work even harder even though every natural instinct in them uh, should say uh, as you pointed out at the picture stay at home don't go outdoors and don't uh, do anything we'll just wait till it over till it's over well the last thing we can do is to wait till it's over so what I will try to convey is some points that I think is important for us as leaders to continuously work on or work with in order to continue to keep our leadership relevant. The first thing I would like to mention is situational awareness. You need as a leader to know your people and if you haven't done that till now well then you are in a hurry you need to know your business your business partners and also your business competitors uh, it's a very good thing to listen to trusted uh, colleagues and to to really hear them out to 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 get their view too, in order to try to build a complete picture of your operational surroundings. We see things uh, differently. And um, for a leader, I think it's important to respect other people's views as well. I have never ever met a problem where there is only one answer. So value different opinions. They are very important uh, uh, to your leadership. The next thing is to keep and if possible increase your comp yours and your company's ability to cooperate both with old and with new partners. You never succeed alone. There is what, not one single person on this globe that can actually solve the problem we are standing in the midst of right now alone. But we can do very much together. Um, and if you can make your employees improve their skills in working together, and working together with others well then your company your business uh, have a better chance to succeed it's very easy in thermodynamics if you want to increase the amount of energy in a closed system well there is only one way to do it and that is to open up the system it's very much like that also in leadership if you want to increase the energy of your leadership well you have to open it up to others you have to trust your colleagues and partners uh, because uh, trust is the key to increased efficiency and progress particularly when we are solving wicked problems as we are today you need to plan and think both in the short, short terms and long terms. Many people say that, well, and, and particularly in the military, we have uh, often heard that the plan doesn't survive the first contact with the enemy. Yeah, that's right. But when you have a plan, you also know what to do when you have to improvise, have to make some rapid changes because the situation demands it and you also have something that you can make people work together also when you divert from the original plan 
but the plan is 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 very very relevant and good planning well nothing can uh, actually uh, be better than that uh, even though you have to as i mentioned do some alterations from what you originally uh, planned to do Uh, remember always to lead in, in context. Situation will shift, so will the requirements for you as a leader. Focus on the problems that you can influence and let the others go. Try to build your decisions on knowledge and not assumptions. Give advice and share your opinion too with others, also competitors. Uh, it is important because um, we have to cooperate uh, to fight this challenge and uh, if we want to succeed. It may be late, you might think, to build networks. Well, it's never too late to build a network. And uh, uh, of course, it's harder to do in the middle of a crisis. Uh, but again, operational efficiency increases if you have a good and solid network around you. For you as a leader, it's important to, to dare to lead. Yes, you are a captain on your ship now and everyone is looking for your decision. Decisions can be hard to make. In, in, in the military term, we have something called command and control. So command is something that is given to you when you get your position. It's for you to exercise in ways that will take your company or your unit to reach its objectives. Many people think that control is something that is given to you as well. That is not my experience. Control is something that you may earn through your leadership. When you're leading very complex organization, there is no such thing as control. But if you trust others and you trust your colleagues and you give them room to operate on your attentions towards the same goal, you will have control. Not physically all the time by yourself, but by having colleagues that gives you what they are supposed to give you and together you deliver what you are supposed to deliver for your company. So remember, control, you have to earn that through your leadership. I've always said that uh, to lead is quite easy if you know your business, if you enjoy working with people. And uh, the last thing is uh, if you are a person that others like to be with, they can trust you, they know where you are, who you are and what your values are and in times like this uh, these things seems to matter maybe more than uh, other factors as yeah. if, if you You have, you have to be safe on yourself. You have to, to trust what you are doing and just be that person that you are. You cannot pretend to be any other. And uh, try to keep things in mind. Well, then you have, um, at least uh, in my experience, a chance to succeed uh, as a leader in these uh, yeah, very, very demanding times. <coughs> so... Um... I, I was picking up one of the 
points you were making. Um, if you want to be an effective leader, you need to open up your leadership to create more energy. Um, and it reminded me of a, a um, Chinese saying from an ancient general, an ancient colleague of yours, uh, Sun Tzu, who said that if you know yourself and you know your enemy, and in this case, of course, it's hard to know your enemy, but we can know ourselves. Zhi yi, zhi bi, I think the Chinese are saying. So the thing here is, could you give us an advice? What, what are the voices inside of a leader that you should not listen so much to? How can I, you know, what are the mistakes that are easy to make? How can we control ourselves? Could you expand a little bit on how the leader should take control of himself in this situation? Could you share something there? It, it all depends on, on the organization and, and the, uh, the type of work you are doing. But in my opinion, the, most, the worst thing you can do is to not let your employees, not let your the other subordinate leaders do their job. When you, as the top boss, tries to inflict on everything that they should do, you have to be patient. You have to restrain yourself from picking up the longest screwdriver in your tool set and, and try to make that work uh, in your organization. In your organization. Make people able and give them room to do the job and you will see that they will deliver on time. And that is what I mean by open up. Don't find that very, very long uh, screwdriver and try to do something uh, that others are working on and would have succeeded if they were given room to do their job. Yeah. Very it's about trust again. Yes. I think uh, that f at least for, um, let's call it civilian leaders who are not used to preparing for crises like that, um, it is very tempting to try to grasp control, as you said. Um, for many people who are not used to this, they will think that they wake up in the morning and they have this, they have this need to be totally in control of everything. And from what you say, it sounds as if that is a, more of a hope than actually a plan. It is, it is. And, and to, to have that, well, if you believe that you can control everything, first of all, your business is, is not very effective. And number two, how do you prepare for uh, resilience? If you all of a sudden are out of business for a week or two or three, like is which is very likely during this sort of crisis how do you expect your leaders or your your people to step up if they have never ever been given the chance to do anything close to it it is also very important to remember that that wicked problems tends to have a lot of factors involved, a lot of moving parts. And it is, in my opinion, impossible for a leader to control physically by herself or himself all these moving parts. But you can do it if you let others help you, assist you, if you let others do what they are supposed to do in your organization. But of course, that requires the ability both ways to communicate quite well. You have to know yourself, as you mentioned, uh, but you also have to know your people. You have to know their weak points. You have to know when they need support. And that is not support that uh, is, is verbalized in, well, I take over from here, but support where they feel safe to move forward because they know that when they lean backwards due to the challenges well your hand is there as a reassuring hand telling them well 
just keep on doing what you are doing. We are all in this together and we will succeed if you just focus on what you are supposed to focus on. So can I, can I take from this that you're saying that the, um, let's call it the anxiety, the fear of failure in the leaders themselves may be actually at some times interfering with providing the security and the safety of people who ultimately have to go out there and make do the actions and make the decisions it's it's natural to be in doubt it's natural to think well is my plan is our plan now really working is my leadership enough to bring this company through the challenges we are facing it's it's natural to think these uh, thoughts uh, but don't think, don't, don't try to, to stop that way of thinking because it will ins inspire you to actually carry on and be even better. But you cannot like, like, let those thoughts take command. Uh, and and, and th there is one point I didn't mention. How do you uh, stay fit to stay in this for uh, the whole time? Uh, we are now facing a crisis that may require our leaders to to be in to face these these problems. Yeah, maybe a, for a year. Um, but you can't escape. You, you have to find ways to to actually energize your leadership again. And and uh, in my opinion, physical training is number one. And number two is to have one or two very good companions not necessarily within your company that you can actually share your thoughts with and who you know you can trust and who you know you can get a very very direct and and uh, uh, relevant answer from okay thank you very much Olinja Hanlesen, for your sharing your experiences and um, viewpoints on the immediate uh, handling of the situation. I would like now to um, uh, give the word to um, Sven Mollifeiv, um, who has a long experience in handling humanitarian and um, health-related crises uh, across the globe. So, uh, please, Sven Mollifeiv, I welcome you now to Grasp the opportunity and share some of your uh, ideas about the immediate situation with us. Please, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to start by saying that I fully agree with Odin that it is all about people. Whatever you do, whatever business, whatever organization, whatever position you have in among the authorities, it's about people. And leadership is also to understand that corporate responsibility and sustainability uh, is about how we, each one of us, and together, all are doing of a business every day. Beyond compliance as a response to future expectations. Because within crisis, there will always be a challenge on how to respond to the future, to all the new challenges we are facing. And uh, disaster risk reduction and disaster preparedness and emergency response is directly linked to the same kind of mindset. It's, uh, it's a condition in the organization in our minds and among the teams. But it's also a, cap a capacity to act. So if we want to build up resilience, we always need to know how we can use all the resources available, how you can build on that, how you can develop that, how you can see each individual within the team, how you can plan for the unplanned, how you can prepare for the uncertainty, how you can 
also be sure who to uh, trust, who to cooperate with, who to uh, ask for support, who to listen to, what kind of experiences, what kind of expertise, and always remember that everyone needs to be seen. Everyone needs to have an opportunity to feel that they have their own value. And this kind of leadership and mindset must be integrated into the strategy of the business and the organization and the position you have if you work within authorities. It must be owned through the whole line. And we have to, when we work to prevent disaster to happen. And um, when we are working on uh, disaster preparedness, uh, we always need to do the training well. Then you build up a capacity. And when you suddenly meet the understanding within the emergency, you know better how to respond, how to work, even though it will always be different than what you have expected and always a bit different than when you want what you have planned for. But still, you have gone through the dilemmas, the challenges, you know where to find support, and you know how to work uh, together. Because in the emergency, you also need to look ahead. You follow the plans, but you have to stick to the realities, and you always have to be fact-based, and you have to be transparent about the challenges and you to be trustworthy. And you always need to challenge yourself and ourselves to what can we do next. Worst case scenarios, but definitely also always look for the opportunities. And when you have identified, assessed, and managed the risks in the preparation phase, you are also better prepared to respond re relevantly uh, within the emergency uh, situation. In security and safety, to all your employees, to all your people. And um, working in war and conflict areas and meeting natural disasters, big accidents, you um, always also have to work hard to see how can you protect the people, the vulnerable people, protect them and help them effect effectively. But also, how can you protect and help your own people? I mean, the health workers, the people that care for other people. And uh, that is very essential also in a company. I mean, how can you always be sure that your people are safe, have not got the diseases, do know who can take their place if they are hit? How can you organize uh, your daily work in such a way that if someone are hit, someone cannot function optimal any longer? How can you replace them? How can they get you the support you need? So to prepare for such situations is extremely important. And this is also about the situation we are facing in the world today. I mean, with healthcare in danger. We have seen it in war and conflicts. We've seen it in natural disaster, but we also see it now when we meet the virus, the coronavirus, because we see that the people standing in the front line 
are also hit themselves. And what can we do to prevent them from getting the disease? Because when they are hit, they are out of action. And we need their competence. We need their presence. presence. So that's why we must also have a strategy on how we can take care of the people that are standing in the front lines because they are absolutely key. And that is so, I mean, the IT people in a company, the HR people in the company, all the line managers within the company, the people with special competence within a company, people present locally, because we need to identify also who are present, who have got access, who are available, who can we trust? How can we communicate with different areas in a way so we get the support and who can we learn from? Because there is a continuous improvement and continuous evaluation taking place when you have to cope with challenges and crises we are facing uh, every, every day. Sven, I, if possible, I would just want to raise a question right there, because uh, as far as I understand, you have actually been working with crisis where there have been really dangerous, raging epidemics, right? Yeah. And, I mean, if, you, if we link ourselves up to the uh, Ebola crisis yes. uh, in the western part of Africa, yes. um, how do you respond to that? We need to identify uh, people being present locally. We need to be sure that we can give them the support they need because they are among the people. They have access to the people. They understand the people. They understand the language. They understand the culture. One of the challenges in the awareness phase and the uh, working with the information and communication with the people was also to tell them that one of the things they are doing culturally when people are dying and they want to bury them with dignity, I mean, to be absent, to take and touch uh, their bodies and afterwards celebrate them with uh, food is something very dangerous and will uh, lead to the spread of the Ebola virus. So how can we develop a campaign and an understanding that also challenge the cultures uh, with good information, trustworthy information, uh, in such a way that they feel that they want to follow because they understand the reasons why it should be done. And that is relevant to the situation we have in Norway today. Give relevant information trustworthy information, tell people why we cannot do, uh, go uh, physically uh, close together, why we have to wash our hands, why we uh, ha have need to have physical distance, but not social distance because we have alternatives. Understanding what we can do, communicate uh, with competence, and be present among people so that they trust that what you say uh, is actually worth listening to. Well, I find very interesting about what you're saying there, and which I think we need to remind ourselves, is that even in very dangerous conditions, it is actually possible to adapt in the sense that we can do things, we can keep on doing certain things if we just take the right precautions. Um, because uh, the present crisis is a kind of a, uh, it's a kind of an invisible, invisible enemy. We can do things and we cannot do things. It's really hard for people to find out exactly the right level of risk that we can um, take in order to go about doing our daily work and doing our daily operations. So what I think it's very interesting uh, that you are reporting on, Sven, is the capability that will always be in there that we can, if we understand and communicate correctly, 
we can adapt to a certain extent to the situation and keep going about to doing our daily business to some extent. Absolutely. But I, once again, I want to underline what Odin says about trust. Because transparency is key. I mean, you have to tell people about the realities. But you always have to tell them about possible solutions and give them explanations on what not to do so that they have an understanding. Uh, because that motivates better, that makes them better uh, in position to tell other people to follow what is right to do. And uh, uh, that's why we have to build a good communication to be trustworthy and to be effective into difficult uh, situations uh, like we are facing uh, today. It's all about trust here. I get this is a this is very valuable and useful information and I also think that what you both of you are underlining here is the fact that we can through using our competencies and our knowledge about our uh, employees and the key people around us there are actually resources that we can raise and we can use them for short term adaptation uh, and I think um, just ending this section on the here and now situation I think the question is, of course, is optimism important here? How, how would you, what would you say, Sven, about you know, the, uh, the emotional situation that people are in? Does it play a role? Definitely. Emotion is extremely important. And that's why the statement of it's all about people is so extremely important. And um, we have to listen to people's uh, emotion and not at least to take fear seriously, because fear hurts. Fear is difficult because it keep energy and you actually very often also act in a irrational uh, way. So the way to take care of people when they feel the uncertainty uh, when they are afraid, uh, but also when they are sad and when they are angry when something is happening and they could have done something different to prevent it from happening. We must understand that people react differently and we must respect them. So the understanding of taking care of people's dignity, of the differences and the way people react differently and try to see how you can support them and make them become a part of the future solutions by being seen, by being taken care of, but also to invite them to become a resource in their own life and in other people's life, I think is extremely important. So if you move the emotions of fear and, and anger into a position of looking for an opportunity to make something good. Uh, that uh, is extremely uh, important for the people's health, but also the, for the way we can respond uh, to the crisis we are facing every day. Thank you. I, I think what you have been commenting on here is uh, actually a very good um, answer to the question we one of the questions we got in here is how to balance the communication to create hope and belief without uh, suppressing the uncertainty and the danger and i think you you've been both commenting on that um if i take uh, what you've been saying to try to condense it a bit i would say that in order to be adapting we have to be realistic about what we're facing but we have to turn it into um uh, acts and capabilities that we can plan for where we can actually communicate around it. I also take from what you're saying that um, the people in charge of this, the leaders, should be very um, aware of how their own emotional communication, that they communicate something around the psychological safety of the people inside the group so that you keep attending to the psychological health of your own management team and the most important people around you. Because if 
if fear and anger uh, start transporting around that, also your information mm -hmm. and your situational awareness, as Uldi Nihamlesen was talking about, all these things might actually be harmed by those emotional processes if they are not handled correctly. May I add one thing? I mean, I think it is very important that we are loud and clear about our roles and mandates and expectations and do expectation management in a good way because if people don't know their realism in the expectations put forward by the leaders uh, it can be an internal uh, crisis which is also very difficult yes. so that is one point and another point is that when you are loud and clear as a leader, keep a position in your own body still being humble. As Udin said, we need to listen to everyone. Everyone has got the resource and competence worthwhile listen to. And in the end, because you must never take away people's hope and the feeling of being treat treated with dignity then we get the best out of people and uh, not an other crisis within the organization. Thank you. Very good reminder there. I think it's time that we move a little bit on because as uh, people say nowadays, the virus doesn't really know any borders. Um, we are facing a um, situation where people always would want to have some perfect local situations, some local solutions that might fit their needs, but that would possibly create a difficult situation for others. So um, moving back again to Odin Johannesson, I said you have, as a former officer, uh, you have been taking part in international operations and now you are of course um, giving your services to a long range of businesses that are operating across all sorts of local and national borders. What would be your take on how to think in a broader perspective around the present situation? First of all, I must say that I think uh, today all of us are global, and that is uh, the fair or the, the sheer fact that we are all connected on this one. So uh, you cannot actually escape from the global world wide web, which means that you have uh, information with the speed of light in your pocket. As soon as it happens. So all of us uh, and particularly leaders need to be aware of that. We are not operating in a closed system here. We are operating in a global system whether we like it or not or whether our politician tells us something else. We very much depend on each other and each other's ability to deliver uh, to the common good. And if we are to actually fight the real crisis that we are seeing today, um, and uh, in my opinion, we have two real crises today. And number one is the global challenges we have uh, concerning climate change. Number two is pandemics. And right now we have the uh, coronavirus, but we must not forget that there are other uh, pandemic challenges still out there uh, with no answers. And we have seen uh, diseases that we thought we could control uh, blooming again. Uh, in, in, in our own part and in other parts of the world. So, so um, climate change and the season should of course be in the forefront. But talking about today, well we have right now, in addition to the climate change and, and the, the, the need to do something globally, uh, we have three, th three crises hitting us simultaneously. And I've already mentioned one, uh, the uh, COVID-19 corona crisis, uh, which have great impact on all societies 
and how that will end is not for me to see and i will not try to uh, forecast anything uh, the only thing uh, i would say though is that we need to stand together if we are to have a chance in smoothing out the long-term effects of this one then we must not forget that we were actually in a very <clears throat> delicate and challenging international situation before the corona crisis uh, in many countries we see what i would like to say fading democracies our values that we have actually fought at least one world war uh, in order to defend are not in a way losing terrain how can how come how come that we stop believe in freedom in our democratic liberal values that has brought us to uh, the standard of living uh, that most of us uh, are enjoying today and many more people are coming um, we see confrontations between major players there is a trade war going on between united states of america and china uh, from a, a european perspective from a norwegian perspective we see a very much more self-assertive russia leaning forward in order to claim her demands we see a world society graduate gradually diverting from the international order uh, and this is led by uh, for instance the united states of america who has in many ways been the architect behind uh, the united nations and all its bodies uh, created to actually try to avoid war created to try to solve uh, challenges and problems in uh, decent ways without bloodshed um, and on the top of that we have a financial crisis and an oil crisis and that is between russia and saudi arabia but because it is about oil well it has an impact on many countries and particularly norway uh, when the oil price is about 25 well i think i saw yesterday 22 dollars a barrel uh, well that gives us a challenge um, and of course the uh, the corona crisis uh, definitely has a financial impact as well that we we, we cannot uh, uh, describe uh, today so if i if i may come back with a, a question here uh, the, the coronavirus crisis itself is not only a medical or a kind of a healthcare crisis it is also in many ways a financial and global political crisis. Oh yes, we we have in Norway we have more than three hundred thousand unemployed people at the moment. So where I am working, uh, that is uh, very very high on the agenda. How do we get normal day starting again? How do we get the functions up and running again? We might not even have them operational when this one is over. And, and we, ha we have to remember that this is not something that will go away in a week or two. If we use the most uh, pessimistic views, it will last for al almost two years, at least uh, until we have uh, some, uh, uh, a medicine that can be uh, applied uh, in order to, to, to protect us against this, this virus. So uh, yes, it is uh, a completely new situation that lies ahead when where strong leadership is required but most of all strong leadership is not 
a leadership that isolates, that thinks it has the answer to this equation. Strong leadership is about transparency, it's about trusting people, and it's about creating an environment for cooperation internationally. That is the only way we can actually deal with this one, in my opinion. We're getting in a question from the side here. Uh, people are asking, if some companies are now in a cash flow crisis and have to reduce headcount, how, to, how do we keep the focus on the people? I guess some of your member organizations, so they know, are in the situations. Have you, can you tell us anything about discussions going on or how people have been thinking around that? We have to have two thoughts, uh, handle two thoughts simultaneously. And we have to make this discussion, um, bring this discussion up in the open. The most important thing we can do is to keep the wheels running. Because if the wheels stop turning, then the society will not be able to fight the corona crisis. We have to remember that our value comes from those who actually create the values. All those small companies and enterprises out there uh, that makes a difference every day by producing what they should produce and selling them to people who wants to buy it. We cannot actually live in this country by letting the government pay us some sort of unemployment due. That will not last. So our most important issue now is to get back to the normal situation again and to handle the crisis simultaneously as we do that. And that means that we need to protect the weakest, but those who have had the disease and those who don't have any signs of being infected needs to do what they should do in order to create the values. Then we have to understand that, well, since this is not a Norwegian problem, but a global problem, uh, it doesn't help whether we are working perfectly well. Uh, the rest of the world has to work perfectly well as well. The good thing there is to see China gradually coming back again, up and running more and more. And hopefully that will be the cases in all other countries too. But then again, the, un the question mark here is what traces that does this disease leave behind? How many companies will actually be out of business? How many uh, enterprises uh, don't have the necessary funds to actually go on uh, in the future? And can there be some sort of uh, assistance in order to make sure that we don't lose the most important one? There are lots of questions that needs to be answered. Some are being answered and some will be answered in the future. But the most important thing here is the employees, each and every one of us, uh, that can do what we, we can do in order to try to make the society uh, prepare for a normal situation again. It takes a long time. A final word from you on one question that I wanted to ask. From your experiences with global politicians when they're trying to solve conflicts, and you look at the present conflict, do you think that the politicians in the world that they're now trying to find true global situations, or do you think that they are just now looking at their own uh, local problems first and foremost? Uh, what's your feeling on how the world as such moves when it comes to uh, coordinating their acts here? It is, it is very, very dangerous for a retired general to actually say much about politicians. Yes. But what I would say is when we look back um, to a not so very, uh, we don't only look back that many years uh, to find uh, politicians that actually valued working together on bigger issues. And in my opinion, I think that is uh, what we should strive uh, to do um, in the years ahead of us now.
we need to work together if we are going to bring uh, all these uh, affected countries, and that is basically all of us, back on, on a good track again. Uh, is it cannot be won, or cannot be won. Uh, this war against the virus cannot be won in isolation, and and um, and particularly the effects of it, the second and third order effects of it cannot be won uh, if we only believe in ourselves. We need to believe in others, and we need to believe in the international system that has actually given us so much uh, since World War Two and up till today. Thank you, Odin Johansson. It's, uh, it's, uh, let's vote for the optimism here. I, I, um, I fully share your opinions there. So uh, with this, I just want to give the word on to Sven Mollekler, who has seen international organizations cooperate to alleviate humanitarian problems before. Sven, would you share some of your thoughts about what goes on now in a long-term and global perspective, please? Let me start with where uh, Odin ended. Um, about solidarity. Solidarity is also common faith. I mean, we have to challenge the realities together. And uh, the world has seen tremendous improvements, actually, since we developed the UN Millennium Goals. Uh, at that time, mostly decided by states. But m even more important, Point. when we managed to develop the 17 uh, sustainable development goals uh, in partnership with business, civil societies, authorities, and based on research, uh, understanding that uh, to fight war and conflicts and to fight the climate change and to create sustainability, we have to work uh, together. We have seen hundreds of millions of people been lifted out of poverty, more people got access to medicine, to education, child uh, mortality has decreased, uh, but now we are facing a crisis that are uh, linked together and make it even more difficult for us, also because business are uh, hurt and the virus uh, are not meeting any borders, they uh, affect uh, us all. And business will not succeed in a society that fails. So we all have to find good solutions on how to prevent, to protect, to help, but definitely also to see how we can support uh, each other in an extremely uh, difficult uh, situation we are now uh, facing. So to lift up uh, the solutions, to learn from the good results, to see how we can support each other and to think um, locally, but uh, to, to act locally, but to think globally is extremely important in, in this uh, situation. And that's what we see also working uh, internationally uh, in uh, with with uh, crisis in wars like uh, Syria, uh, where we have to work together with uh, people being present locally, with a special mandate based on humanity, neutral, impartial, independent, crossing borders, but with support from the UN system, support and and cooperation between the non-governmental organizations but always working uh, in a perspective on how can we build resilience, how can we fight the conflict, the, the reason for the, for the problems. But now, what can we do to prevent the most vulnerable people in the refugee uh, camps, uh, people that has lost absolutely everything uh, when the virus also will uh, uh, them. When we worked together to fight the Ebola in, uh, in West Africa, it was also to challenge the authorities, work with organizations being present, use the experiences also when uh, now we are fighting uh, with the, against the Ebola in, in Congo, 
to see how we can learn, how we can support, because this will affect uh, us all. And within the big international challenges and crises, we are also facing a lot of difficulties. What about the health workers? I remember when all the local humanitarian workers in, uh, in their own uniforms, crossing the front lines, helping the most vulnerable, only based on a humanitarian mandate, were killed for doing that. Being a victim, being uh, something they wanted to attack to make people even more afraid. So we have to do what uh, Odin says also, to stand up for international humanitarian law, for human rights, for child law and for the refugee laws that the international societies has really agreed upon. Because we have to stick to those things to be able to also to fight uh, the difficulties uh, in the challenges when a disease like the corona uh, hits us. And in those crises, we also meet uh, difficulties like kidnapping. I mean, when my friends and colleagues were kidnapped in Somalia uh, to do whatever we could to release them, uh, because they were there only present to help the people to survive in the, that conflict. When my friends and colleagues were killed, shut down in a hospital in Chechnya in 96. Um, they were there only to help the people in need. So we need also to protect uh, the health uh, workers, the volunteers, the population uh, in such uh, situations. And that's about solidarity uh, uh, at large, actually. It's about standing up for, uh, for standards, and for international agreements. And that's what actually uh, we all have to do every day and not uh, only think that that has something to do with other people and I don't care. We must care together. It, that's a, a very good point. And I was just thinking that what you're outlining here, if I just may re quickly uh, recall some of the developments that have happened with the present virus uh, problem, um, it, uh, it started out because it very quickly, it hit people in, on the move. It hit the Chinese New Year, it hit the big airports. So what we see is that the virus is spreading through all the big transportation hubs, obviously. It spreads then, uh, which is interesting at the moment, it has affected a number of, uh, let's call it wealthy people, powerful people. We've seen people from royal families. We've seen politicians. We've seen celebrities. And then, which is interesting because it, it, contrary to many other problems, it has actually hit some of the affluent societies well-to-do in the first place. Then it starts trickling down. So whether ethical or not, what is going to happen, I think, and that's what I wanted to ask you about, Sven, do you think that as the virus starts hitting, say, let's say the, the poorer people and the people, the societies with less control over their healthcare systems, mm. um, do you see uh, scenarios, foresee scenarios that could boomerang back? Uh, because even if you say it's not my problem, it could actually be destabilizing and doing things to the global situation. That is a very, very important point. And that's why solidarity is so important. Because when, when we in the NVGL, um, together with you in Global Compact, ask leaders all around the world about the biggest risks uh, in the world to see how we can turn the risks to opportunities by lifting up the sustainable solutions. We were a bit surprised that business leaders and leaders from organizations uh, stated so clearly that inequality is one of the biggest risks. Not only because it's wrong because of human rights, but also because if they are out of business, they're not part of the market. And on the top of that, if they have nothing to lose, they will affect us all 
and they can easily be recruited also to uh, to do political actions and terror uh, which will destroy us all. So that is actually uh, something we should uh, learn from and use as a motivation to see how we can fight inequality because uh, we have seen the rich world now also been hit by the uh, coronavirus. We have seen how business being hit. We see the market. We see how all the societies are uh, hurt. But still we haven't up to now seen how that can really affect most, most vulnerable people. And we have not only a responsibility for them, we have a responsibility for the world and for ourselves to do whatever we can to prevent that from happening and to help the people and to build up healthcare systems, uh, resilience and sustainable uh, ways of giving information and to develop education and medical care also for the people in most needs. That is a challenge that uh, we have to take uh, together actually right now. Thank you, very good comment. Um, we are approaching the point where we are looking at a number of questions coming in. So if everybody's comfortable that we could probably have a look at some of the questions. Okay. Um, and I'm seeing here, uh, there is a Francisco writing in here saying, you mentioning going back to normal. How different will it be the new normal? Will we ever get back to something normal? So not only in terms of working conditions, but also social, economic and political instability. Uh, while the world, um, will we, the world ever be a normal place again, or will we see some lasting changes? Does any one of you want to have a go on that? Well, I can, I can try. Um, <laughs> what is the new normal? Uh, well, I, as I tried to indicate, uh, it's hard to actually define the normal. But what I'm sure about is that uh, we as humans uh, will find a new normal that is uh, functioning the way we think it should function. Um, how it will look like, well, only those uh, who live through this crisis will actually see. Um, but, but that we will find a way of overcoming this challenge as we have overcome similar uh, and other challenges in the future, I'm, I'm sure of. I think um, we have now seen a lot of innovations, creativity, new initiatives. Uh, we have seen the digitalization being used for the right purpose. But there is also a big challenge that it can be used for the wrong purpose. And uh, we give uh, the politicians opportunities now to decide something on our behalf because we trust them. But if politicians are using this situation to, uh, uh, to destroy democracy and the possibility uh, the people have to influence their own uh, daily life and, and future, that can be uh, very difficult. So that's why we have to be careful, we have to follow, we have to be present, we have to strengthen democracy, we have to see the youth not only being the leaders of tomorrow, but being the resources of today, to invite them into processes uh, from day one all uh, over the world. And uh, if we can manage now to learn from each other and to uh, appreciate what uh, different countries have done uh, in such a way that we uh, also can, uh, can help other people doing it better, I, I think uh, we have an opportunity to, uh, to do it even better. But uh, there are a lot of challenges now with someone that wants to misuse this situation. That always uh, happens. But that's why we uh, have to invite people to, uh, to uh, be present and to involve themselves, to be seen. Uh, and that's about uh, leadership. Uh, act local, think global, uh, 
think also next step uh, and take care of the unique principles the world actually managed to uh, decide on after the Second World War. I don't think we would have managed to develop the human rights without that uh, terrible crisis that the war was. So uh, the, if, we, if we are doing well and the right thing and do the right thing right, we can be even stronger but then we have to act now and we have to be, uh, be active uh, all the time. And uh, research must also take their responsibility and business must see that business will not succeed in a society that fails. Uh, we've got another question here uh, talking about the political situation. Uh, um, the question is, will this uh, present situation lead to a further decoupling uh, between China and the United States? Um, and how will the Norwegian and the uh, European companies move in this international market how would, or in this political situation? Do you have any ideas about that? What, one of the good things with business is that it is international. We can and we are crossing the borders. So we must challenge the political leaders also to uh, see how we must uh, still be interlinked and uh, not be that polarized and to uh, see that uh, we have uh, common challenges um, where we are standing right now and also in, uh, in the future. And, uh, but we will see, of course, that they are competing the different countries, the different interests but it must also, we must also challenge them to, uh, to cooperate and not only think for themselves right now. Well, Daniel Hollison, do you have any takes on that from your members or the situations? Do you think uh, the situation the, will be more polarized after this? As some of the... I, I think uh, um, Sven uh, gave a very good answer to this one. Um, if you look at the politics, on the political level, there are a lot of arguments and there are a lot of uh, words going back and forth. If you look at the practical level where value is actually created underneath, there is a lot of good initiative, a lot of good opportunities ongoing. And then you, you, you can always uh, say, uh, well, what, what of these two factors will actually uh, be the strongest one um, and I believe in, in the cooperating factor what businesses are actually doing and we see that in other areas too where countries are not very vocal about what they are doing in order to address climate change but when you go in to see what the different parts of the country is actually doing you see another uh, policy played out than what is actually verbally uh, articulated uh, from the capital. So um, I believe that business is, as Sven said, it's international and it's so strong that it will continue to drive cooperation. And of course, competition, but that is part of the game. Yes. I was uh, just thinking that in some ways, you know, in the, um, uh, the Chinese word for crisis is weity. It's, uh, uh, it's a combination as most people talk about now, it's a combination of the possibilities and dangers. Will there be any, can you foresee that there will be any good things coming out of this? Well, I, think we always learn from crisis. When there has been uh, disasters, accidents, we have developed new standards in the world. We see that from the maritime sector, from the oil and gas sector, but we see it also from uh, other uh, things that has happened and new medicine has been developed because we are faced with uh, new challenges. So um, we take new initiatives when we are really uh, challenged and hit. So uh, that kind of uh, innovation and of uh, good competition, but also good cooperation uh, will always 
effects of the, uh, of the crisis as long as we always follow it uh, uh, closely and, uh, and see that it's done for the, the right purpose. Uh, because we, I mean, we have to realize that it can be used the right way and the wrong way. Um, the worst case scenario is of course uh, an atomic bomb explosion uh, in the world where everything uh, is uh, really destroyed and nobody will be capable to uh, take care of it uh, in a proper way. Um, so when what we learn from Chernobyl and from Fukushima uh, is that uh, we uh, strengthen the uh, safety and security part but I think we learned also quite a lot about uh, fear uh, in that situation. So uh, what we should do is now to really uh, stick together and see how we can cope with this situation um, cross borders uh, internationally, um, but always see how we can develop good local societies and, and good national societies but thinking uh, globally. I think that can be um, something we can all uh, look for, um, but it will not happen if we don't care. Uh, uh, may I just have uh, one uh, comment on this one? I, I, I completely agree. I think the only thing, uh, we are humans, we, we are learning, or constantly learning and constantly willing to develop. And um, the only thing we need to actually fear is fear itself, which I think President Roosevelt said in his inauguration speech in 1933. And he said very much wise, that president, but the only thing we need to fear is fear itself. We need to actually be the leaders uh, who enjoys, um, and, and this is a German word, it's called in German Verantwortungsfreudigkeit. Mm. And that means something like the joy of responsibility, to enjoy it. In Norwegian, uh, I use the word ansvarsglede. Mm. And if our leaders and we as leaders supporting our leaders, national leaders, uh, think a little about that we can actually uh, come through this strengthened. And there are, in the midst of a crisis, a lot of positive things. And I would like to just mention one, and that is the way we address uh, the digital technology. Suddenly, uh, my kids are actually doing school from home, and they are actually having, good, having a good opportunity, good school from home. And it was all planned in two days. My, my, really, my, my congratulations to those who actually put this in place. But we are actually learned digitalization. I think one, it was one person who said, we have taken a 15 or 10 year leap in a couple of days. So yes, there are positive things also. And we have to think positive uh, about how to come out of this one. I, I would very much want to applaud both the last uh, comments. I think there, in every difficult situation there is a, obviously a great possibility to learn and improve things. And I think um, the fact that we are here now, we are operating and we are together, even if we are physically isolated, we are still together, we are still thinking and we are still welcoming viewpoints and the possibility to discuss and digest what's going on. So I think actually, um, speaking on that, I just want to give a, a quick summary of what we are saying here. Number one, yes, there is a crisis, but you need in the crisis to listen to the middle managers and the people around you. Opening up leadership, as Odin Johannes was saying, because activating and energizing people is one of the most important things we do. You cannot take control, you have to earn control. I think that's an important lesson to take home. 
And to take it from Sven Molkai, you have to prepare, you have to practice, you have to exercise, and you have to rely on the possibility that even if the plans don't come out as you hope them to, the acts of planning, the competences that you're building up will make it possible for you to go in there and uh, empower people to do the right things so that we can bring the situation under control. On that note, this isn't only a problem that affects you here now. We are in the midst of a global situation and that affects how we should look at the problem. The problem isn't a medical problem. The problem is in many ways a big humanitarian and a political problem where we need to keep communicating and we need to keep finding solutions across the world. Um, I would say simply um, to add to the optimism here that the problem, even if you should think strictly in a business way, well, it doesn't really matter if all your customers are you know, at home, not buying things or even dying. So the point is we want everybody to come back safely. And I'm quite certain if we keep our heads calm, if we do not fear fear, we will be able to stand together and find out through sense-making what will be the best ways of meeting this situation. Um, Sven Molkaev, Odin Johansen, on behalf of the president of the I, I am really, really happy to have had you here. I'm so happy that you could come here and share your thoughts and your experiences with us. In this, what I would call slightly um, artificial environment, but there is nothing artificial about your intelligence. I'm really happy for you coming here and sharing all these stories. And of course, I'm extremely happy for the hundreds, actually, of people who are out there listening, sending in your questions and responding in various ways. So um, with this, I just I want to thank you all for you know, joining in, taking part in this discussion. And it will be the hundreds of participants out there who will actually be now implementing the solutions. Good luck to all of you. And on a final note, I want to say that we will keep on this uh, um, series of seminars. Tomorrow we will have one in Norwegian, uh, communication in a time of crisis with the same panel. Uh, Sven Molotov and Ole Johansson will be back on Friday in Norwegian, uh, leading through a global financial crisis uh, with another panel talking more about the financial issues here. So I would welcome anybody who has the possibility of taking part in the next couple of panels to invite people to get back and of course vigorously to share your opinions and ask questions. We all have to adapt to this medium. Udino Hansen and Sven thank you for joining us and thank you for being here today.